Jesus could come back today. It's false. And self evident. And we have to look at that. Okay. Right, so good morning to everybody out there in Internet Land. We're streaming from Michelle Tom Cox's house here, North Park Lantern. South or North? North Park Lantern. And we want to do some more when we get to our uh, Bible session. Some more on the so-called pre-tribulation rapture, the notion that Jesus could come back this moment and take you all to heaven to seven years. I think this is false, and I want to show in more detail, I was done on that last week, but in more detail why that is really not a good idea at all, to believe a falsehood like that. I know it's a bit strong, but we'll get to that um, in a moment. But meanwhile, Michelle has chosen a song for us from the Church of God hymnal, if you happen to have one. I sing the mighty power of God, number 71. So, we'll have a little group come forward and render three verses in that, please. Okay. get my organ tuned up over here. house where we're allowed to meet in freedom here in this extraordinary nation which permits us to study the Bible unhindered, unmolested, and unharassed. We're thankful for every person who's taken what is our duty Sunday by Sunday to assemble with the saints, to celebrate the faith, to learn, and to pro propagate the faith as best we can to all those who would desire to learn. We ask you to be with us now, especially we're thinking of the sickness among us, there are various diseases and ailments. And you know these better than we do. We pray that you would alleviate these in your inscrutable way, that you'd show us means by which we can achieve a better state of health. We're looking forward to the ultimate health, of course, in the kingdom. And we look forward to that day. We pray your kingdom come. We also pray for the leaders of this nation. We are commanded to pray for the executives of the nation. We ask you to extend your wisdom to them to give the best possible chance for the truth to prevail in America and across the world. We do commit these leaders, executives, into your hands and pray for them. They would allow us to continue in freedom. Now we ask you to be with us with your operational presence and power, your spirit, the spirit of Jesus among us. We thank you, Messiah, for dying for us on the cross. And we pray that you would be with us, guiding and directing our minds, illuminating them, 
and we might be in line with the truth that you spoke so eloquently when you were here and continue to speak through your spirit. Be with us now and we ask your blessing upon all of us here and those streaming with us today. In Messiah's name we're praying. Amen. Amen. All right. So it is the day of the month when we're going to be doing the communion. Normally we do that the first Sunday. We didn't do it last week for various reasons. So uh, Carlos will be doing the communion service for us after the end of the sermon. And uh, next week we will not be meeting at all because Carlos and Sarah are away. And we haven't had a break, I think, from many years, actually, very, very seldom. So we will not stream at all, I think, next Sunday. Next Sunday. Right, no, no church? No church next Sunday. This next Sunday. After that, we hope to resume God willing as usual. Every Sunday, this is the Lord's Day. It's the Resurrection Day. Jesus was crucified on a Friday. He rose on the third day, Sunday. And it's correct that we should meet. It's not a transferred Sabbath, we understand that. But it's the right day. And the tradition in Acts 20, verse 7, is exactly right. We're following the apostolic practice. And we want to continue, as I mentioned, uh, to discuss the issue of the so-called pre-tribulation rapture because it's a major part of our view of the future. But we do have some other things we wanted to mention. We have a project going here. We're going to contribute, some of us, if we want to, that is, those among us by choice, if they wish to contribute to a, a project that Vince has very kindly organized for us. They have to put a billboard, a notice on a billboard on the freeway. I remind you that the Seventh-day Adventists warn us on one of those billboards that we're meeting on the wrong day of the week and we're under the mark of the beast because we're meeting on Sunday. And they are right because they're meeting on Saturday. This suggests the chaos that Christianity is in and we're trying to remedy that. But the project is this, that we will pay some money, uh, I think roughly six or seven dollars per family, was it per person? Per person. Per person. Uh, anybody who wants to be part of this, seventy dollars will... will We'll uh, do it, uh, collect it somehow. We'll, we can do that easily. And what we'll do is put a sign up which says, Jesus was not a Trinitarian, why are you? And then we'll have our Restoration Fellowship or Restoration Church website, whatever is most suitable, and see how that goes. We'll try it. If it fails, we did at least try. If it succeeds, we'll just buy a bigger house so we can meet 5,000 people here <laughs> every Sunday. But let's try it and see what happens. It's a provocative question. If you love Jesus, you're going to love his words. You're going to fall in love with his words. And his basic words were, of course, the Lord our God is one single Lord. That shouldn't be hard. But many of us have come from backgrounds where we didn't understand easy things like that. So let's see what the public will do with that. The, least they, the worst they can do is verbally attack us. We are protected by the law in this great nation. They probably could not burn us at the stake, although they would love to do that if they could. That's not permitted these days, and I'm very grateful for that. So that's one of our projects. Secondly, then, we have a brief letter from a lady in Scotland, which Barbara has, and will read for us. This is what keeps us very excited with what we're doing, because a letter like this will come from distant Scotland. Her name is Miranda. We won't, we won't give the rest of the name, but Miranda, maybe even out there listening to us, I'm not sure, but here's what Miranda wrote the other day. Thank you so much for replying, and I am reading more of your articles, which are so interesting and easy to understand. Thank you. If you're right about all this, and I'm sure you are, then this is amazing. The idea of Jesus now, as you explain him, makes me see him in quite a different light. I have come to know Jesus Christ, but now I feel that I know him even more so. I am an ex-Jehovah's Witness. I left the organization several months ago after 33 years. The teachings just got too unbelievable and there were many other serious problems which I think people are aware of now. It was hard leaving, but I think I'm more or less over it now. Since leaving, I have come to know Jesus Christ and gradually coming to the realization that God really is my Heavenly Father and not just a friend. I do my ministry as best I can. I speak to people about the Bible, but being a Christian on your own can be lonely, and I would love to be able to associate with other Christians. I have been in contact with Robin Todd, and he has put me on his list, but unfortunately, there are none of your people who live anywhere near me. I live in Edinburgh, Scotland, 
I will just have to be patient with love. That's very sweet. She was a former Catholic, by the way. That's interesting. Roman Catholic. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door and they explain things like the sleep of the dead resurrection, right? So she's sat for 33 years. She's got a married son living close by and he's come out too. So we've got a uh, family along with her. That's very touching. So I said, when I read emails like that, I said, Let, get, what's your phone number? I'll talk to you. Because it's, it's exciting to me. And she, she phoned me right away. Obviously not a problem the long distance call. Just like she was in the next room, you know, from Edinburgh. Isn't that marvelous? And we're just chatting away. And this is a sister. This is a brother and sister relationship now. She's absolutely no differently at all. With God being one, Jesus being the human Messiah, and the gospel about the kingdom sleep of the dead. And I want to tell you another thing today. It's interesting. Carlos gave me this this morning. Tormented in the afterlife, but not forever. This is Edward Fudge. Edward Fudge is a Church of Christ man. He's given his life to establishing the idea that God will unfortunately have to eliminate the incorrigibly wicked, but not torture them forever. You'd think that that would keep people out of church, wouldn't you? It ought to. The God that they're worshipping out there in religion land here is a God who's going to torture you forever and ever, literally. People don't think about it, but think about how awful that is. And Edward Farge, the Church of Christ man, saw that part of the system is not right. And he, he wrote a book called um, Consumed, the, Consumed by Fire, what is it? the Consuming Fire. And he's, he's made it his, his project to get public information. I met the man several years ago, and now he's attracted the New York Times, uh, an article in the New York Times about this. So we'll go heavy on that for a few weeks when we finish with the preacher of rapture, see if we can stir up some minds uh, and exonerate God from the blasphemous accusation that a baby being born in Atlanta as we speak now has already been predetermined to be tortured forever. you think that would keep people out of all churches, wouldn't you? It doesn't. They still flock to church to hear that. I don't think they talk about it much, but it's still open. Anyway, so that was of interest. All right, so we were looking last week, and uh, as I said, during the week I really got driven to think we need to do more of this. The issue of the second coming and your view of the future. Now, I want to stress again, this is not arguing Bible doctrines, heavenly. It's not some erudite, scholarly thing that only people pick over the Greek. That, that's the way the devil presents it, by the way. The devil presents the faith as always complicated. You've got to know all your Greek and your Hebrew and have... All, no, no, that's not right. That's to, to dignify a lot of that stuff with more dignity, I think, than it deserves. For example, we went to a garden uh, opening, an open day for, for a garden locally yesterday, and the dear gentleman in charge of the house there with an extraordinary garden, not only did he have a sort of get saved booklet right in, as he signed up to go in, it was a get saved booklet, then he had an invitation to Bible study. And so we're right in the house and he begged me to come to the Bible study. He said, you seem to be quite interested in the Bible. Please come to our Bible study. He said, no, I, I can't commit myself to that. You come over and we'll talk to you. And so we started then and he's really on fire to get salvation. He's a Church of Christ person. I know all about Church of Christ people. And so we agreed on water baptism. That's always a good point with the Church of Christ. They insist on water baptism. Actually, you do it because Jesus said do it. Water baptism, good point of contact. Then he said, the kingdom of God came at Pentecost. That's what he believed. Now, he was very decent with, very nice to talk to. It was an animated conversation with some of the other people listening and listening. And there was a dog there looking up in a tree because there was a squirrel in the tree. And I said, there's a model of this dog. <laughs> Talk about concentration, right? Listen, Israel, that dog. Absent rapt attention on the squirrel in the tree. I was looking on the same He said, yes, I believe at Pentecost the kingdom of God came. Now, to you, that sounds fanciful and ludicrous, doesn't it? Because you would have been saying, well, do you think that Satan has already been bound? Do you really think the nations are beating their swords in the bag right now? I mean, do you really believe that? But you're assuming your view. You see, he doesn't understand any of that from his Church of Christ background. He doesn't believe in a free meal arrival of Jesus. He doesn't believe that. He believes the kingdom began at the cross or began at Pentecost. I will. So, we start on that. Of course, the easy answer to that is Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If you happen to have it, you have to look it up. Acts 1, 6 and 7, these, these are verses the devil is not keen on because they completely ruined his deceptions. Acts 1, 6 says, after lecturing for six weeks on the kingdom, the risen Jesus came back. Here I, here I am, I'm alive, touch me, it's me, myself, I'm Jesus. 
Then he lectured them on, guess what, his favorite topic in Acts 1 6. He lectured them for six weeks, 40 days, on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Yes, you sound like Jesus if you talk about the kingdom. You don't if you don't. So, that lecture for so or that series of daily lectures, how many hours did they do per day? I don't know. But they're talking about the kingdom for six weeks. At the end of that series of lectures for six weeks, the disciples, the students, asked a really good question. They said, Lord, is it now the time for you to restore national sovereignty to Israel? It's a good question, isn't it? The kingdom of God has something to do with restoring, restoring political sanity in the Middle East with Israel important, Assyria important, Egypt important, that's it, that's it, Isaiah 19. Of course that's right. The kingdom of God was first in that political thing, spiritual political thing is coming in the future, and it involves you, of course, as the managers, governors, and rulers in that kingdom. That's the whole kingdom idea. That was a great question. But Calvin didn't think so. Now, Calvin's the guy that murdered Servetus. He murdered the Unitarian Servetus by burning him at the stake. You can read the book from the California lawyer, Reeves, called Did Calvin Murder Servetus? He did. Calvin died unrepented. He didn't think he'd done wrong. All right, so here's what Calvin says about that verse. Is this the time for you to restore the kingdom of God to Israel? And Calvin says, there are more errors in that question than there are words. You see what's happening there? The devil's not keen on that question. Because that gives a whole game away about the kingdom. Is this a time to have peace on earth, national sovereignty restored, the apocatastasis, the restoration of all things? Is it time to have that? Calvin says, what a dumb question, those stupid people. Don't they know the kingdom is in your heart, you see? That kind of right. Don't they know the kingdom is not political? It's purely spiritual. They love that word, spiritual because it sounds impressive. What they don't know is that having Jesus back sitting on the throne in Israel is very spiritual, as well as very political. You see that? We're driven by this Greek dichotomy between the real world, the spirit world, you see, and the physical world. And when Jesus came back, he said, touch me, I'm not a ghost, I'm palpable, touchable, but he was a spirit person. You realize that? It didn't mean he was... Just a, 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 a breath of air. So we're so completely drugged by our Platonism, which says that all the spiritual things happen up here, and all the miserable physical things happen on earth. that we're drugged by that. So Calvin was wrong there in saying there are more errors than words. There are 11 words in the Greek there. 11 errors. You see what that does? It attacks Jesus as being a rotten teacher. Jesus had laid with these people for three years, three and a half years. Sent them out to preach the kingdom, do miracles. Another six weeks of lecturing on the kingdom after he came back from there. And poor old Jesus, he couldn't get it through their thick heads that the kingdom of God has nothing to do with Israel. You see that? You see how subtle that is? Can you show this to your neighbors as if they'll come and talk to you and explain that no, the kingdom did not come at Pentecost. All right, I haven't quite finished because in Acts 1 6 they asked that question about the kingdom. And Jesus' reply is not, you idiots, don't you know the kingdom of God has nothing to do with that? He didn't say that. He said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Ah, the fact that the kingdom is going to be established in Israel and the Middle East, of course, is absolutely clear to them all. But you don't know the times and the seasons. That's to say the chronological stretches of time and the individual points of time. That is not known to you. But, in other words, you don't know when the kingdom is coming. And he didn't. Jesus didn't know. Only the Father knew that, apparently. He didn't know. But he said, you're going to get the Spirit in a few days' time. You see the contrast? Isn't that brilliant? A few days' time. That's, that's within a, a, several days, right? The Pentecost. But you don't know where the kingdom is coming. Now you're all of us bright enough to see that the kingdom of God could not be the day of Pentecost. Is that right? If something's coming in a few days' time, that's one thing. If something else is coming at a time where you have no idea when it's coming, right? That's not the same thing. It's about as, about as smart as saying that I think that Thanksgiving is Christmas. We're at the level of absolute futility here in our Bible study. If somebody's taught us in church that the kingdom came at Pentecost, we're not much smarter than saying that Thanksgiving is Christmas. It's very much So our job, your job, is to get out there, blog, get on a blog, blog for several hours a day, and do that, I don't know what you do. Make videos or something. Try to help that out. 
Okay, anybody want to say anything about that, Thomas? Have I stood anybody to a frenzy or not? No? Um, we just have Maybe one, here. one clarification that we, we have said before, but yes, in a very very short clarification, if you would. Mm -hmm. When Jesus says that the kingdom of God is among you, yes. uh, that does not mean that this is the kingdom right now. And if somebody who kind of thinks that this is the kingdom right. right now. Yes. What, with respect to that, that view, what they've done is to take one out of a hundred kingdom verses. The one that they know, the kingdom of God is within you. King James, almost certainly mistranslated. That's a difficult verse because the Greek is slightly ambiguous, but the least likely is that he said the kingdom of God is within you. He's actually talking to Pharisees, and that would be very strange for him to say it was in them anyway. That, that's odd. But if he means it's sort of the interior kingdom, that would be very, very exceptional. But more likely, he's saying the kingdom of God is among you. You Pharisees, in answer to the question they asked him, they said, when's the kingdom coming? It's a great question. And he said, are you so blind? The kingdom is right here. Now that's also true. Now you have to be able to handle the future kingdom, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, and handle then the wider idea that the kingdom is already here in that sense. The king was there. You're looking at the king standing and you're missing him. You're just looking at the future kingdom. So then he says in that one, that one off verse in Luke 17, what? 17, 31, 21, 21. He says to them, possibly the kingdom of God is among you. The third possibility, I'm afraid to make this difficult, but the third possibility he said, is this. <coughs> People are going to say in the future, rush over here to find the kingdom. Rush over there to find the kingdom. Look, it's there. But look at the moon and the stars. They're going to get signs of the kingdom and so on. He said, that's not going to be right. When they say, go chasing over here for the kingdom, go chasing over there for the kingdom, no. the kingdom of God will be all of a sudden, all over. Unmistakable. So it may be a rebuke of the false idea that you can go and find the kingdom in the wilderness, it won't do that. It's going to be a spectacular public event. That's also possible. All of which is to say that that's not the verse you start when you do the kingdom. <laughs> but that's where they always do start. I used to ask the Salvation Army people on the on the tube train coming back from the American school, I'd say, you know, I'm writing on the kingdom, tell me what do you think of the kingdom of God? And they would always say, King God's the you, King James. They'd use the King James, King God, and that's it, that's the only kingdom verse they do. So that is just not right. You take the balance of all the kingdom texts, and you start in Daniel, you start in the Old Testament, and you do Luke 21, 36, says the kingdom of God is about to come at the second coming. That's, that's where the kingdom starts. It's wonderful. It's very easy. Anyway, so we've got a lot, to, a lot of work to do. Gentlemen, yes, sir. I think it says, uh, you have been translated into the kingdom. Oh, good one. Okay. That's a verse that yes. torments you a lot. That's right, very good one. Colossians yeah, 1. Little bit. <laughs> no, no, yeah, absolutely. Colossians 1 13. You have indeed been translated into the kingdom in the extended sense. If the kingdom is there, it's also extended backwards to the present. There is a presence of the kingdom. If I find the Spirit of God cast out the demons, Jesus said, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That almost certainly means the power of that kingdom has that operated in your life. I don't deny that. And I would say the royal family is right here. You are the kingdom of God. So you have been transferred from death to life, that's John. You've moved from death to life when you get converted, born again. And so in that sense then you've been transferred from the kingdom of the world, have you not, into the kingdom of God. You see, Paul is bright enough, he can handle all that. We're not very good at that. So, oh, here's one person. Well, let's contradict the whole of the rest of the world. No, let's not do that. So, oh, by the way, the Church of God, I think, stumbled a little bit on, on that. They, they couldn't get rid of that verse, so they said it meant we've been transferred in view of the kingdom. No, don't do that. I wouldn't do that. You have been transferred into the kingdom in this other sense that you are the kingdom. I think it's the best thing to do that. But you can also then show that in the same letter, or very, very much the same time, Paul says that no adulterers will inherit the kingdom of God. So here's a good point. Say to your friends, no text says that you've inherited the kingdom of God. No, you've not inherited the kingdom of God. You've been translated into it in this unusual sense of Colossians 1.30. But no text says you've inherited. You're always heirs, never inheritors yet. And by the way, you're not ruling the world. You know that. It's a heresy. First Corinthians 4, they thought they were ruling the world. He said, you're so puffed up and think you're kings. Would to God we were ruling the world also. We're not doing it yet. So that's a heresy to think you're ruling. You're not ruling the world now. You're, pre you're preparing to rule the world. So I think that's the best I can do with that. It's a great, great point. The, the book reference was... Um, 
Luke 21, 31, rather than 36. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Luke 21, 31. Excellent text. It says, when you see all these things, end time things happening, and know that the kingdom of God is about to come. The other one that can use a lot is in Mark 15, 23, probably. Mark 15, 23. Joseph of Arimathea, who was a student, a disciple, he's still waiting for the kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? Have you missed it? This is after the death of Jesus. No, he hadn't missed it. He's away, and he wants it. In the early chapters of Luke, they're all waiting for restoration of the kingdom in Israel. This is very Jewish, right? But what the church has done with this is a disaster. They said, oh, the kingdom is a wonderful idea, but not the... the sorry. The church has said, the kingdom of God as a political idea is the husk that you throw away. The real kernel is the spiritual kingdom of God, see? They call that Jewish thing, what they call Jewish, the real political kingdom on earth in the future. That's the husk that you're supposed to get rid of in order to become more spiritual. That famous word spiritual, you see? Again, this is platonic dualism that's rather ruined the system. Okay, otherwise, no more comments there. Uh, he did not say we are in the kingdom. No. He said the kingdom is within us. That's you are looking at Jesus. That's right. This, we are not in the kingdom. That's right. that's right. If you want to go to our website, we have an article there called The Kingdom, Present or Future. And I go through all of those verses. You're not said to be in the kingdom. That one word transferred into it is, is the exception. But they love to do the exception and forget the 100% or the 99% of verses. Anyway. So Mark references 15, 40, Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm my, my brace. 1543. Chosen of Arimathea, who was a disciple, is waiting for the kingdom. Acts 1 6, where we started, is this the time of the kingdom? You don't know that, right? He says, you don't know. You don't know the times and the seasons. But you're going to get, in a few days' time, this empowering thing at Pentecost, mm -hmm. which you can't reproduce absolutely today, unless you expect the house to shake when we pray today. It could. But are we disappointed? I don't think so. I'm not expecting the house to sh literally shake when we pray. It can. But some people are trying to be very Pentecostal, right? Uh, that gets us on to the whole thing about languages, by the way, speaking in languages, speaking in languages, speaking in languages, not speaking in tongues. Forget that. Speaking in languages. And a whole lot of people are speaking in languages out there without ever verifying whether the language they spoke is really a language. That's another sign. All right, so back then to the issue of the future. Now, is this... As one scholar says, something we really shouldn't worry about. This is even William Lane Craig, who's otherwise a very good apologist. He says, I have no opinion on end times, doctrines, although people always ask me. I don't know and I don't care. I don't know and I don't care about the rapture. He's against it. He's got an article against it. But I don't care about it really. What's more, I think that thinking about the exact timing of events at the end of the age, at the end of the world, is a waste of our time. It has no value whatsoever. And I said, wait a minute, I thought you loved Jesus and the words of Jesus. Why then did Jesus give us a whole chapter, Matthew 24, and you just don't get it right, Mark 13 and Luke 21, a whole chapter, one of the most exciting things to read, okay, you get through it, I do every time I read it. They ask him, oh, the sign of coming at the end of the age, this is thrilling stuff. And he gives them a detailed answer, which isn't that complicated. Supposing someone were to say to you, as the Jehovah's Witnesses at your door do, that they, the ones at your door, are not born again, these are the Jehovah's Witnesses at your door, seven million of them currently, all around the world, they say that they, the ones at your door, are not born again, not saints, and not part of the body of Christ. Did you know that? That's where you started the JM. Before you tell me about yourself, let me ask you a question. Are you born again? No. Are you a saint in the New Testament? No. Are you part of the body of Christ? No. All right, so then the New Testament doesn't really apply to you. It really doesn't. They, they, want, they, want, they want to tell you this, by the way. But the New Testament strictly applies only to the 144,000 special ones, and they are not that at the door. Isn't that amazing? How do you convince seven million people who work hard at this and build their beautiful kingdom halls all over the place that they're actually not part of the New Testament scheme? They're, they're outside. Isn't that amazing? 
Alright, suppose you know what it's saying to you. The teaching of Jesus is not for you, it's for Jews. The teaching of Jesus is not for you, it's for Jews. Jesus spoke to Jews, of course he did. It's not for you. All this for you, the Jews are not for you. Now that brand of mind of falsehood comes in two versions. It lurks behind much of what you get in evangelicalism, where Paul is really the center of everything in Jesus' systems. It lurks there, but it is blatant in the people who came out of the way international, and they taught their guru, their doctor, who didn't really have a doctor, but their leader said that the teaching of Paul in the late letters of Paul is the only thing that counts. This is called dispensationalism. You want a learned word, you don't really. It makes it sound too complicated. But dispensationalism in its extreme form says that only Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, those prisoners, those are the only ones who really count. Teaching of Jesus of the Jews. The teaching of Paul earlier than those then isn't for you. Can you imagine how bad this is? Honestly, folks, it's not very difficult to see. It's not rocket science to see that if you've got a, a modicum of understanding, you're streets ahead of, of that. Imagine having to preach on Sunday that only the late letters of Paul count. This is so horrible. Okay, so imagine that someone is saying to you, the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus is asked by James and Peter and John, tell us, Lord, they're talking about the temple, they've seen this building in front of them, Tell us, Lord, when is this thing going to be ruined, the temple? When is there going to be trouble in the temple? And what's the sign of your coming at the end of the age? They asked that question. He gave a long discourse. Given to James and Peter and John. There are five people who speak of the Pharisee in the New Testament. One is Jesus. The other is James in his book. In Peter, you find it. And first John, you find it. And who else? Paul. Oh. Massively. Five. Five of our eight New Testament writers talk about the second coming in order to clarify this. Revelation. Book. John and Revelation. Yeah, that actually doesn't mention the word parousia. I'm just talking, of course it talks about the second coming. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. My point here is, if you just want to concentrate on this one word, second coming, which in Greek is parousia, it means the arrival of any dignitary to take over his territory and you go out and have a welcoming party, you go out to meet him and escort him in the direction which he's coming. Five people in the New Testament actually mention that with parousia. So what's happened today is, out there in religion land, since the days of the Schofield Bible, which came from Derby, a Plymouth brother in England in the mid-1800s, he passed the idea onto Schofield. How many Schofield Bibles do you think are out here? Millions. It's in the notes of many of your evangelical Bibles. And that's the idea of a double second coming, you with me? For me, the second coming is one grand public event to end this age and to inaugurate the new age of the kingdom, I see. But they came along with this incredible notion that there's a double second coming. So now they've got 25 verses listed for the pre-tribulation rapture coming, Another 25 verses for the event of seven years later. Isn't that amazing? You could, each of you could have a ministry just doing this one topic. Easy. You could vlog for hours, and you create a, a rompus, and some people say, that's interesting what you think. So I, I just want to suggest today that this is really outrageous. Rather like dividing Jesus into two, you know? The God part and the man part. Well, the God part doesn't die, but the man part dies. Well, did Mary bear the, the God part or the man? And all that stuff. They turned Jesus into schizophrenic person. They've done the same here, exactly, with the pre-tribulation rapture. So, the worst thing is this. They're using the word rapture out there to mean the pre-tribulation rapture. They've stolen the word rapture. The word rapture is a noun in English, obviously. It's found only in one place. We looked at it last week, and that's in 1 Thessalonians 4, I think verse 15, sir, am I right? No. Let's switch. Let's, let's get it right. First, first Thessalonians chapter 4 will be caught up to meet him. There's a, 17. 17. Seven, only there. It's a verb. will be snatched up, caught up to meet the Lord as he, as he comes. But what they're not going to tell you is that Paul is talking about, when he's talking about this catching up, the rapture, he's talking about the parousia. So what does it say in verse 15, sir, of this passage? First Corinthians, first Thessalonians. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. You got it? We who are alive and remain until the parousia. We're going to focus on this word parousia and establish that it's one single event, not two events divided by seven years. That's just frightfully complicated and just terribly bad. It would be rather like saying, I thought this morning, suppose you're looking forward to the coronation of the Queen in England, and you know that she has this big journey with all the beautiful ceremonies. It's on the way to the Westminster Abbey, right? Suppose you suddenly said, well, I think all of that stuff and the journey to the Westminster Abbey, that's one event, and seven years later she gets crowned in, in, in the building. Matt, see that? That's what they've done with the second coming. They've said the second coming is, yes, it's that spectacular event, but seven years before that, there's a secret, unnoisy, silent, rapture, resurrection, but they won't tell you that, but they believe it. It's the resurrection of all the saints, seven years old. It's just mass chaos. Mass chaos. So we'll, we'll do our little bit to try to sort that out. You've got the word parousia there, right in First Thessalonians 4, verse 15, the very passage where they start to teach you about a pre-tribulation rapture, you see? The very passage they start to use to show this pre-thing is the very passage which calls it the event the parousia. Well, would you not think that Paul might be using the word parousia as Jesus used it? Wouldn't that be a place to start? I suppose Paul knew about parousia. He heard that Jesus talked about that. So where did Jesus use it? Twenty-four verse three. That's what he says in Matthew twenty-four verse three. Well, they say, "What will be the sign of your parousia and the end of the age?" It's in one breath. The parousia is, I want to tell you, the end of this age. It's very clear. This is very easy in principle. Matthew twenty-four. Jesus is after the parousia. Now, tell me, in Matthew twenty-four, did Jesus speak about the parousia? Did he use the word? What do you think? In Matthew 24. Are we going to find the word? How about verse 27? Somebody read verse 27. What's that saying? Please. But just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. There's the word parousia. Does that sound like an invisible secret thing? Hardly. So they asked about the parousia, and he's answering about the parousia, and he's described it there. Does he use it anymore in Matthew 24? How about verse 30? Yes. Yes. Verse and 30. then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Right. Now, really, that's a verb there. It's not the noun, but it's the same idea, obviously. You know, if you're talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you say he's going to come, it's not rocket time to put that together. But he hasn't finished yet, because suppose you go down to verse 37, what does that say? 37. And we got verse 37 for us? What's the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the coming of the Lord. Right, read on for us, a few more verses. Whereas in those days before the flood, there were, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving and marrying mm -hmm. until the day that Noah entered the ark. And one more verse, please, please. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So was the coming of the Son of Man. Isn't that amazing? Did that get your attention? Yeah. So to them it will come uh, as a thief, like a thief. Right, it's the part of the So they will be overwhelmed by it. So to them it will be like a surprise. Course, but not to Christians. Not to Christians. Course. The point is the coming word is right there in 37 and 39. This gets my attention. The flood of tragedy destroyed every human being on earth except for eight. And Jesus used, he, he, that's real for him. He's thinking of that event. He says, listen, the second coming is going to be like that. And this gets me a little scared, doesn't it? I mean, how can William Craig say, well, I don't care about end times. We don't talk about, what, what? Well, let's not talk about the flood. Let's pretend that didn't happen. And this is major stuff. It's huge. The first book of the New Testament. I mean, yeah, it's not like it's some obscure That's thing. Right. It's 
Absolutely. And Jesus saying, Jesus saying, a disconnect, I'm sorry, a connected lecture in answer to the question, what will be the sign of your coming, parousia, and the end of the age? Mistranslated in the King James, the end of the world. The end of the world. The end of the world, what's that say? There's no world beyond that. But the end of the age, wrapping up the present age of history. So, so is it fair to say that this pre pre system mm. they devised not so long ago, yes. uh, makes Christians, uh, puts them in the same category of non-believers, well, because then they, they will be caught like, well, they like you yeah. know, like when, when, Chris, when you hear Christians say, yeah. well, he can come this morning, this afternoon, or tonight, yeah. so it puts the believer in the category of the non-believer, on that point, yes, because the believer should be awake, should know Jesus' words about the things that have to take place before sure. he comes like a thief sure. for the non-believers, but it makes believers really not Well, I think it's obviously serious. And people will say, well, are these, issues, these aren't issues of salvation, so let's not talk about them. Well, could we not just improve, even if we don't decide it's an issue of salvation at this moment? Could we not do better? You know, why does everything have to be, well, if it's not an issue of salvation, I'm not going to bother. That's just that's a waste of time. But I think it could be very serious because when the Antichrist eventually shows up, the single Antichrist, 1 John 2, 18, that verse is correct, you've heard that Antichrist is coming, 1 John 2, 18. Yes, they knew that. You've heard that the Antichrist is coming. When that Antichrist eventually does show up, that final man of sin, obviously, you would expect that you are being, you should be taken into heaven before that. Then you're terribly shattered, aren't you? You've got to give up the faith. So this has catastrophic consequences. We're supposed to watch so that this stuff will not catch us unaware. Yes, yes. So we're supposed to be aware. That's right. And we're supposed to know the scripture yes. so we know the signs. That's right. And we know that when this big thing happens, we know it's Jesus. But we also know when something else happens that yes. sounds like it's Jesus, yes. that that's the counterfeit. Exactly. But we know Rumors of that that is not yeah. Jesus, this you know, world ruler who's going to be very charismatic and bring people Absolutely. along, and everybody's going to say Jesus, and they'll even do miracles, right? Yeah. The Antichrist. Well, we'll look at that and now. yet we we have to be aware. Okay, so exactly right. We'll, we'll go to that passage in, in just a second. My point about the Jehovah's Witnesses is saying that scripture is not for me. The New Testament. Okay, that is applying also to these people in church here. Say, ah, Jesus here in Matthew 24 is not talking to me. He's talking to Jews. You got it? <coughs> That's fatal. Once you take yourself away from the words of Jesus, you're sunk. Jesus keeps saying, especially in Matthew 12, uh, John 12, 44, his final crying out to the public is, listen to my words. Don't lose my words. You're going to be judged by my words. And Darby Scopium and others, Will, and the rest came along and said, no, no, wrong. You can't get much worse than that. Our people will say, well, they got me into the Bible. Yes, they did, but it's very hard to get you undeceived. That's the problem there. It's yeah. very hard. With Armstrong people, oh, he got me studying the Bible. Yes, he did. But you're still keeping the Sabbath and wearing the tassels. Perhaps you've gone even further into the law. It's very difficult to un undo what's been learned from. Just on uh, yeah. what uh, mm -hmm. Michelle brought up. Yeah. Uh, Apocalypse 3.3. 3. Revelation 3.3. 3. It's a very good uh, indicator. Therefore, remember what you received and heard and obeyed and repent. If you do not wake up, I, I will come like a thief and you will never know at, at what hour I will come against you. Okay. That's exactly the same for the Paul. Yes. Wake up. Excellent. The yes. time of your salvation. Cool. You be alert. As she, she put it well, Michelle put it well. We're supposed to be aware of this. Yeah. This is not an academic exercise. This is for us to talk about and to pass on to our children here, look at Matthew, if the age goes on, 30, 40 years from now, I don't know, when the second coming is, he'll be able to tell this to his children. So you pass it down to the gentleman. So if you don't uh, hear, listen, hear, see, mm -hmm. obey, right. and repent, right. we're, we're in non-believer status. Right. We're, we're, we're okay. You're going to be caught by the first. Let's go to the passage of your faith. Please. What is so amazing yeah. is the speed at which this rapture doctrine has embedded itself uh, into religious orthodoxy. 
we came to the States in 81. Mm -hmm. We saw a car with a bumper sticker that said, in case of the rapture, this vehicle will be on land. And we thought it was a joke. We couldn't, we had never heard of this thing. Really? What? In 80. In 81. Well, we we in had never heard of it, and we honestly did think it was a joke. But now it's to, it's embedded. We have movies about it, a new one coming no, out. Everyone is is of the opinion that this is scripture. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a takeover. Yeah, if I can show another verse here, which yes. is, you know, in this new, there's a new Left, left Behind movie, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And we were wondering, because we watched the trailers, the, the preview, we were wondering why uh, the people being raptured left their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, they, sh <laughs> right. they, they show us sitting in an airplane, and the, and the seats, all you see are whatever, they had a book, their clothes. Well, I just read here what, where this probably comes from. Okay. It's Apocalypse 1615. Okay. Look, I will come like a thief, again yeah. a warning. Yeah. Yeah. Blessed is the one who stays alert yeah. and does not lose his clothes, <laughs> so that he will not have to walk around naked what? and his shameful condition oh. be seen. Okay. So that's <laughs> Oh my. Well, we are going to be arrayed in white robes. So maybe that, we don't that's need to be naked. You don't need to be naked. If you're arrayed in white clothes, you're not naked. Immediately get those white robes. <laughs> so Lane Craig here, the, the fellow who is against the rapture, but he doesn't care. But he's strong enough to refuse it, but he doesn't care about any of it. He says a good many Bible believing Christians. It absorbed the preacher of rapture as their mother's milk, as it were, and never thought to question its biblical credentials. Note the contradiction. Many Bible believing Christians didn't believe the Bible. You hear that? Many Bible, so called, believing, they weren't really. Bible believing Christians absorbed this preacher of rapture as their mother's milk. That's a good picture. And they're sitting there nodding. Our friend Jeremiah sat down in California. Turning point. Huge audience. If you've got an 800 number, you can call it all 24 hours a day and order the book. It's a vast institution. Chuck Missler, no one. So they're putting this out. We have to do a little bit to try to obstruct it, I think, because it's big. Yes, you're going to say something. No. Oh, yeah. I, I used to go to a church that. Um, mm -hmm. As soon as you started talking about any of this end time yeah. stuff, tribulation, they didn't care. They, they really did not care about yeah. it because they're like, well, I'm going to be raptured and up in heaven before any of that happens. So uh, who cares? They don't even want to study it or learn it or understand it. Right. Well, that's right because if you're watching it from the sky, who cares? You're raised in the Antichrist. You're watching all this from the theater, the audience up in the sky. Why did Paul then give you the detail, which we're going to look at now? We could spend many weeks on this, by the way. It's a huge subject. And when you start teaching it to other people, you, you realize you know, there's a lot, a lot to this. Go to 1 Thessalonians a moment. Concentrate, my, my concentration point is on this word parousia. Are we really talking about two different events separated by seven years? I don't think so. 1 Thessalonians. This is really, these letters are all about the second coming. We love this subject. What about verse 9 and 10 of chapter 1? Could somebody read that? Verse Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 9 and 10. I'd like to read that. Matthew, you have a beautiful voice. First Thessalonians. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, mm -hmm. and? and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Yes, to wait for his son. And the Joseph of Arimathea was waiting, and you are waiting for the kingdom. So you turn to the living and true God, because that's the unitary monotheistic God of Jesus, not the Trinity. You turn to the Trinity. You turn to the living and true God, and then you are waiting. This is first century 50 AD. These are early letters of Paul. Waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from dead, he throws in the resurrection there. That is Jesus who is rescuing us from the wrath to come. Ah, they say, well, there you go. Jesus is going to rescue us from the wrath to come, therefore he has to take us away before the Great Tribulation. It's false. The Great Tribulation is not the wrath of God on the evil world. 
it may indeed be the wrath of Satan on Israel and the believers and all that, but it's not the same as the wrath of God. But we are not going to suffer the wrath of God because the wrath of God is poured out at the same time as Jesus comes. We don't need to do all the detail of that, but it's certainly not seven years earlier. The wrath of God comes when Jesus appears, and he's not going to pour his wrath on the bride. You get that, right? He's going to pour the wrath of God on the bride. You're coming to marry the bride. So it's absurd to think that he would pour that. Now, you can escape the wrath of God. God is not going to plague you with all these awful plagues at the end if you're the bride of Christ. Okay, so that's in chapter 1. Now, let's look at another of these wonderful things about the second coming. We're concentrating on the word parousia. That's the Greek word for second coming. Uh, verse 17, three verses, so, or just do four verses, 17, 18, 19, 20, of the second chapter of First Thessalonians. What about that? 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, <laughs> were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Mm -hmm. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. You see, said something of the of Paul's compassion for his people. It's wonderful, isn't it? The great mind embraces everything. They're just longing to meet each other, see each other again. Satan got in the way. Satan was allowed to hinder them. For who is our hope, in verse 19, or crown? or exaltation. What's the thing that really gets us excited about the future? Is it not even you, brothers and sisters, in the presence of our Lord Jesus, at his pre-tribulation rapture, no, no, at his parousia? Guess what? Supposing Paul is talking about parousia just as Jesus did, you see? How fearfully complicated that would be. You've got to say that Paul here means by parousia something totally different from what Jesus meant. It's just absurd. Go to chapter 3. 3 verse 1 talks about being left behind. <coughs> <laughs> it does. There it is, left behind. Totally in different Bible. context. Good point. In Athens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not on earth. But yeah. <laughs> so if you're left behind, you're going to be left behind in Athens. That's what you got. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't see the word rapture in the Bible, but we do see left behind. We do, so. we do see left behind. <laughs> Sorry, somebody, somebody, somebody was telling us that you had a humorous thing about left behind that we weren't on the Okay, go to verse 13 now. What about 13? We're, we're tracking the word parousia. What have we got in 13? So that he may establish your hearts, so the lesson for us all, without blame, 313 of 1 Thessalonians, without blame, in holiness, before our God and Father. That might suggest that God is the Father. What do you think? God and Father, at the parousia, here it is, of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Oh, with all his saints. Okay. Now they're going to say, if he's going to come with his saints, he must, seven years earlier, have come for his saints. That's a huge leap. He is going to come with all his saints. It could be angels here, it doesn't matter. The saved saints. Holy one. He's going to come with all his early angels as well. But you see, how is he going to come with all the saints? You know, by raising them, meaning, and then they do indeed come together at this one event. You know? So this one is twistable. They can twist this one and say, oh, this is a, a separate event with his saints. He's seven years earlier, he came for his saints. All of which is imagined. Now you must realize that Dallas Theological Seminary put this on the map big time. You could not work as a professor there unless you believed this. It's amazing. Well, most people believe that these saints are people, that believers who are dying and go to heaven immediately. Yes. They're all up there now. That's right. And you're just going to bring them yeah. back to earth. That's right. But in, in the case of the pre rapture, if you would bring them. Heaven. Let's see, well, how would that work? Okay, they're in heaven already on yeah. their theory. Mm -hmm. And then at the pre rapture, Jesus is going to bring them from heaven. And then unite them with the surviving Christians seven years yeah. earlier. That, that's the way they would think. Or their physical bodies that are in the Yeah. They're disembodied. Okay. Okay, so then in chapter 4, we went through... Let's, let's do this four, fourth chapter again to make this absolutely clear how this works. 4.13. We don't want you to be ignorant. Unimportant. 
brothers and sisters. I love this. You get, you get the feel of Paul. Sometimes, you know, one wonders, it's, it's chopping the Bible up into verses. We have to do it. Do you know how disastrous that is in some ways? We sort of fixated on this verse, and it's not wrong. You have to do it to reference them. But these are letters. When you get a love letter from your boyfriend, girlfriend, <coughs> you didn't normally put it into verses, did you? You might have put it into poetry, but you didn't number it. This is, this is real living Paul. Can I just go back to yes. something you said about the Holy Ones? Yes. Or the saints? Yes. I will. Uh, could be angels or us. Yes. Are, are angels ever called saints or holy yes. ones? Yes, yes, holy ones, yes. But not saints. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. No difference. So they are called saints. Yeah, there's an ambiguity there. They are saints. And you're saints. And Jesus is a saint. Can you? And God is the Holy One too. So Can you provide that? Um, well, it's, you can look it up easily. I, mean, I, right. I don't know the verse you but it's, it's, it's quite clear. Holy ones is simply Aiyis, Aios, Aiyi in Greek. Aiyi, holy ones, which is saints, yes. So, there's an ambiguity there, but that's fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, certainly, in where, we're, where we are now, in 1st Thessalonians 4, don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Isn't that beautiful? The dead. Sleep of death. That's an easy job. I mean, how do we We don't want you to be worried about Aunt Jane who died. She's died, and she's... What's happened to her, they're saying? They didn't know. Paul knew. They didn't know yet. For, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with him, with Jesus, that is, those who have fallen asleep. Now, how is that going to happen? You could get misled on that verse. You have to read on He's going to bring, well, Jesus is going to, God is going to bring, sorry, God is going to bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. That could be understood to mean he's going to bring the immortal souls back with Jesus. You see that? If you don't read on, you have to read on. How is this going to happen? He tells you in 15. For this is what we say to you by the word of the Lord. Oh, I'm copying Jesus, he says here. Well, guess what? He might be using the word Pharisee just as Jesus did. Why not? That sound good? Why not? So, there it is. The word of the Lord is this. We who are alive, and Paul includes himself there. It doesn't mean that he had a date. Paul is part of the corporate body of Christ. Corporate thinking. We Christians, whoever it happens to be when the time comes, who are still alive and remain until the, what's the word here? Pharisee. Guess what? He might be talking about the same Pharisee as Jesus. Imagine that. Of course he is. The Pharisee of the Lord will not have any advantage, don't read the King James here about prevent, children will not understand it at all, will not prevent, what? Prevenial, come before, in, in the old English, prevent has a totally different meaning what it has in our English today. The correct translations here will not precede, will not have any advantage over those who have fallen asleep and are asleep. A Greek perfect tense implies an event in the past with present results. We always learned that early in Greek. So, they fall asleep, guess what? They're still asleep. They're sleeping the sleep of death. Another four, 16, four. A little Greek word, ha, please. This is what I mean. This is unpacking my logical uh, process here. For the Lord himself, Jesus, will descend from heaven with a shout. How silent is this? A shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Messiah will rise first. I mean, is this difficult? I don't think so. This is how it is that Jesus gets to bring them with him, you see? He raises them, catches them up, then indeed they come with him. They escort him in the direction which he's going. Then he says, then we are alive and remain, we'll be caught up. There's the rapture word, just a verb, not a noun. We'll be raptured, caught up, together with them, in the clouds, to meet the Lord Jesus in the aera, in the space, the subunit space, and in this way, and by no other means, we get to be with Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? That's the only way you get to be with Jesus, by this splendid, public, noisy event. All right, now take this verse about the trumpet and compare it with Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew and look at 24. Can I just read yes. the, my verse for this? Please. Uh, this is the sixth, yeah. no, yeah. second part of 16. First, all the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Marvelous. That is all. Oh. And also it says in, in 15, uh, 
uh, we, uh, when the Lord returns, um, as we who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not rise to meet him ahead of those who are in their graves. <laughs> it's astonishing. But you tell that to the congregation out there, they won't understand it at all. <laughs> it's gotten so confused. All right, now, again, do you think Paul could be talking about the same event as Jesus? Well, you just read about a trumpet, didn't you, then? Didn't you read about an archangel? Are you going to tell your JW friends at the, at the door? This doesn't mean Jesus is an archangel, because he comes with the voice of an archangel. They believe it, seven million of them, not less or more intelligent than you at your door, as we speak around the world. They tell the public, Jesus is mindful of the archangel. Why? Because if Jesus comes with the voice of an archangel, he must be an archangel. Oh? Well, if he comes with a trumpet, he must be a trumpeter. <laughs> it's not very difficult. But once you get these people in church, dedicated, that's why our friend, the letter we read earlier, 33 years she believed this, until somebody said to her, blood transfusions are contrary to the law of Moses, you shouldn't have one, you should die rather than take blood if you're in an accident. And then some of the group said, you know, we know that's wrong, but we're not saying nothing. We're not telling anybody, you see. Then it becomes dishonest. And this dear lady wakes up and says, oh my goodness, and the rest is now history. Isn't that fascinating? To that event, to stir him to that. All right, you've got then the trumpet, and you've got, what is it, the, with the, oh, angels, right, the trumpet and angels. Now go back to Matthew 24 and see if this isn't the same event. Well, in 24, verse 31, Son of Man is coming, in verse 30, 31, and he, the Son of Man, the human being, will send forth his angels, we've got angels here, with a great trumpet, why this word, a trumpet? And those of us who kept the Feast of Trumpets way back, you know, we know that's the event in the calendar that certainly pictures the second coming. That's amazing. It's not a silent event. That's just been constructed out of thin air. That was deceiving not me. All right, we've, got, we've done First Thessalonians. Now we'll get to Second Thessalonians. No, actually, first, before we go there, First Thessalonians 5. Having said, this is the only way that you can get to be with Jesus. Now, he then says, what about the times? As to the times, read on, chapter break it. See, as to the times and seasons, just like Acts 1, 7, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, Jesus said. Paul says, as far as the times and the epochs concerning, are concerned, brothers and sisters, I really don't need to write you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord, oh, I see, the parousia is the same as the day of the Lord, isn't that beautiful? It's also the day of Jesus' wrath coming on the earth. It's one event. The day of the Lord, we've just been talking about it, it goes on. The day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, and they'll stop there. There you go, thief in the night. See, thief in the night, silent. They stop right there, now read on. For while they, while they, while they are saying, the world is, not you, while the world, which is blind and just going about its business, while well, they are saying, peace and safety, we've got it made, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. This is a terrifying event. Oh, they are asleep. They haven't been selling their Bible. They don't know what's going on. It hits them like a thief. But you, precisely you brothers, are not to be so stupid. You're to be awake, looking, watching, listening, for that bash on the door, you know, that allows the people to come in. So while they're saying peace and safety, then it will come upon them. But you, look at the contrast here, but, but you, brothers and sisters, you are not in darkness. That that day, the day of the Lord, the coming of Christ, would take you, would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light, you're products of light, you're products of the day. We are not of the night, or of darkness, so then let's not be sleeping. Going about our business is there really nothing much matters except getting through the, the day. Everything is a total secondary point, but you're the, compared then with you and your loved ones, I would say, being in good standing when this event. You have to try to get them interested. For you are all sons of light, sons of day. You're not in the dark. Let's not be asleep. As others are, most people are sleeping. But let's be alert. And so, 
For those who sleep, after all, they do it at night, don't they? And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. It's a bad, a bad deal. It, it seems to me that Paul is trying to keep these people impassioned, engaged, and that's very difficult to do. Did you say a wrath of Jesus? Yes. In wrath, wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. Reference to Revelation, the wrath of the Lamb. In connection to the day of the Lord? Same, absolutely. Absolutely, same thing. Yes, the wrath of God and the express through Jesus, the wrath, the wrath of the Lamb, the interesting picture. Now, hey, since we, we Christians, are the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of, uh, of faith and love, and as a helmet to shield our brains and our heads, the hope of salvation in the future. For God has not destined us for wrath, of course not, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this verse. Jesus who died for us, so that whether we are awake, meaning surviving, clearly, you understand that. Paul is mixing the metaphors a bit, but you see it here. We, whether we're awake, that's to say surviving, or whether we're asleep in death, we will all live together with him. Isn't that beautiful? This other thing is very confusing, the pre trib rapture. It, it pulls apart what is clearly one. <coughs> all right, now 2 Thessalonians. Paul hasn't finished yet. He still hasn't finished. He loves it so. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, this is one of my favorite passages. Paul is begging the church here. Again, these are not academic arguments that Paul thinks, you know, should tickle their brains and minds. This is the very fiber of their Christian life to get it right. They're in great danger if they get it wrong. So he begins in chapter 2. I love it. Maybe you'd rather read a bit of NLT. Read the four verses in NLT for us there. Uh, two, uh, two, one through four. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 4. And now, brothers and sisters, let us tell you about the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered together to meet him. Yeah. Please don't be so easily shaken and troubled by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Mm -hmm. Even if they claim to have had a vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us, don't believe them. Don't be fooled by what, by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawless, lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. Mm -hmm. He will exalt himself and defy every god there is, and tear down every object of adoration and worship. He will position himself in the temple of God, claiming that he himself <coughs> is God. So what is your impression there? Who comes first? The Antichrist or the Christ? Obviously. And we were taught the exact opposite in the world system. You are the power. Absolutely. The Antichrist, according to the false system, I say false, is, according to the false system, the Antichrist appears in the temple, but before that, what you is? get raptured. It's plain false. You see how beautiful this is? Note that he's talking about our favorite subject in 2 1, right? The Parousia thing. Imagine, he might be talking about the same thing that Jesus talked about. It's so wonderfully simple. It's really refreshing. Well, I have a question then. If, if you read this, yeah. those four verses, mm. and what you were talking about earlier, explain to me how they think that we're in the kingdom of God now based on what those four verses say. What do they do with these four verses? Well, that, that, because that's dealing with another system. Oh. The people who believe in the preacher of rapture probably wouldn't say we're in the kingdom, but you're still right. If you're talking to a Church of Christ person, right. the church then of Christ then people, what right. are they still? I mean, I, I don't know. It's not here. It doesn't. <laughs> it's pretend. I'm confused because this goes against everything that right. they would say is happening. Well, the idea that Satan has been bound. It's really that that whole system, Church of Christ, is right. It's exactly what you're what you're suggesting. It's impossible for me to believe that Satan has been bound, so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer. But that's what Augustinian Church of Christ, our millennialism teaches. Not will will was. No, no, no. I'm I'm very aware of what I wasn't. Yeah, I'm not supposed to be there. I get to go away. Well. That's right. That's right. Well, that. But your point is still a very valid one, and I'm so glad you mentioned that, because Augustine, you see, Augustine is the key to our millennialism, that is, that Satan has been bound already, at the cross, 
The millennium is on now, as Church of Christ, as August, Augustine, Luther, and Calvin, both, they weren't pre -mills. So, that, I mean, the extent of the confusion is, is considerable. That's why we have our Sunday services, I think, in our Bible study. Okay, to read on then, then beyond this, surely your impression is, Paul's whole point in 2 1 is, we beg you, brothers and sisters, the question, with regard to the parousia, don't get shaken up. I mean, you can paraphrase this in different ways, for goodness sake, don't use your composure, because some idiots come along and say, that the second coming, it, the Greek is slightly ambiguous, either it's, it's happened today or it's about to happen on Monday. It's exactly like the rapture. Now, I'm going to say that Jesus cannot come back before lunch. It's impossible. They say he could come back before lunch. That's just wrong. Paul had to fight exactly the same error, didn't he here? Somebody's trying to say, and they're using every pernicious, tricky means to achieve their end. Don't be shaken, don't be worried, by a spirit, this would be some speaker producing this point of view, or a message, or even a letter faked. Here I want you to see the effort the devil is going to make to try to get you off track. You'll stop at nothing. It's a fake letter. As if from Paul. To convince them that the day of the Lord, that's the second coming, the Pharisee, the day of Christ's intervention, has already happened or is about that. It's hard to imagine they really thought it happened, but it's possible. But if it's not that, it's, it's going to happen Monday. It's almost right there. And then he says, no, 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 no. The man of sin has to come first. The very opposite point of view from the preacher rapture. The man of sin has to appear first. So don't let anybody, look at the way he piles on the land. Don't any, anybody, what's the word, sir? Deceive you? Scam you? Lead you astray. Lead you astray. Pull the wool over your eyes and we've done it. Pull All of us in our various ways, in our ignorance, we had to tell the Just, just a word on the letter here. It's interesting yeah. that to this day yeah. they're still digging out all these uh, yes. ancient manuscripts that Jesus had a wife or Jesus, oh, yeah. you know, trying to. Oh, look, uh, we've got a second century document. And of course, it turns out to be a Gnostic thing or a fake. Sort of well, I mean, we, we don't address the Roman Catholic system, but the fact that they think that Mary did not have <coughs> normal relations with Joseph ever, but women wouldn't want to do that, would they? They all believe that. They also believe since the 1830s, it's fairly recent, yeah. that when the Pope speaks from the chair, he's infallible. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. Are we gullible or what? The, the assumption, so-called assumption of Mary was exactly. also only in the 1800s. And just a word on the letter, it, it goes beyond letters. We, we have whole books yeah. written, like the Book of Mormon, too. Absolutely. To mislead and pull it in. Obviously, the devil is very hard at work. He seems to think that it does matter what we believe. He wouldn't worry with all this stuff if it didn't matter what we believe. The devil is very keen for us not to believe the truth, clearly. Okay, so that's the, the man of lawlessness. I think, sitting in a temple, I, I believe the Americans have this right, largely, there will have to be a temple. Very hard to avoid that. If you say the temple of God, you don't mean the church, unless you explain it here. When I've mentioned this point before to you, that when you introduce the Christian church as a temple of God, that's one thing. I can say, you are a temple of God, so don't defile your bodies with smoking cigarettes and other things, whatever. Don't defile your bodies, a temple of God. But in you, in you, when you introduce the subject as the temple, the natural way to read that is, is especially the life of Daniel and standing in a holy place. Very strongly, and I will look at this all the time. I don't think I'm deceiving you as today. It's reasonable to look forward to a temple in the Middle East. Okay, so here's the warning. The man of lawlessness has to come first. And he's revealed, by the way. And he's the son of destruction. He's everything you don't want to be associated with. And he poses and exalts himself about every circle of God, or object of worship. He sits in the temple of God. Exactly like Jesus said when you see the abomination of gestation standing in the Holy Ghost. Jesus and Paul on the same, the same page entirely here. All of this quoted from Daniel 11, that would be a study in itself. All of this quoted from Daniel 11, the King of the North, the final King of the North. Now I love this verse, verse 5. Don't you remember what I was told when I used to teach you? That's amazing. 2,000 years ago, and here we still are. I think that's absolutely spectacular. Did you uh, give an explanation for the uh, rebellion? 
Well, the, the problem is, is apostasy. Oh, that's good. What is the apostasy would have to be some frightful falling away of the faith. It did happen in the second century. It's going to happen perhaps in a, in a second and more dramatic way when this, when the Jews finally take as the real Christ the false Christ. I mean, that's a ghastly. Exactly how I don't know. I do know the apostasy began early on. It's quite clear. But then it culminates in the man of sin, and Jesus is going to kill this person. Is it possible to say something on the level of what happened before the flood where evil oh, okay. was in such quantities okay. of God? Jesus so made that. Could be something look at the warnings that Jesus goes to. Remember Lot's wife now? She dared to look back. She kind of waved in the face, became slack. You know, she wasn't fully on fire. She's a pillar of salt. How terrifying can you get? This Jesus stuff is not just gentle Jesus meek and mild. It's interesting, too, that it says he will be revealed. That means everybody right. is going to know. First, everybody is going to think he's Christ. That's right. I mean, those who are not the elect. That's right. that they will think he is Christ Absolutely. and who has yes. come back and whatever. Yes, you're right. But, but then he's going to be revealed. I mean, nowadays it's like, oh, Saddam Hussein, he's yeah. the Antichrist. Or, what well, was it, Gaddafi? I mean, there was all these different guys that suppose. Spectacular. Or, right. All these different people. Oh, this is the Antichrist. That's, now, we're going to know. Absolutely. Before Christ returns, some point, yep. we're going to know. You're right. Because in verse 3, you're, you're taking your point about reveal. Look in verse 3, reveal. Look in verse 6, reveal. Mm -hmm. And look in verse 3 times, I think. Oh, verse 8, yes. 3, 6, and 8. Revelation. It's a parallel word to the revelation of Jesus. In other words, the second coming is Apocalypsis. Book of Revelation. The revealing of Jesus the parousia of Jesus, and the third word is epiphania, which means the bright, outshining appearance. These are spectacular words, not secret events. Jesus is mm -hmm. certainly breaking the rules here because the general church policies, you don't talk about prophecy to many people. You know, they wouldn't be interested. We, we mustn't involve them in deep mm -hmm. things. Not the new converts. What's the scary no. stuff? No, no. no. I have no opinion on end times, Doc. This is the leading apologetics chap for the whole of evangelicalism. I don't care about any of that, especially the rapture. What's more, I think that thinking about the exact timing of events at the end of the world is a waste of time. Hmm? It's all about your relationship with Jesus. Well, he seems to care because he's out there battling this left behind thing. And at least he's, he's, also, he's battling it, but he doesn't. I'll I don't care. Get how he battles. Give with one hand, take with the other two. Did you deal with this temple thing in the verse? Yeah, the temple. The temple of God with the ark is parallel, definitely. The Daniel passages which talk about the abomination of desolation taking away the sacrifice, parallel to Mark chapter 13, verse 14, which speaks of the Antichrist standing where he ought not to. Matthew calls it the holy place. So it's the, the natural Jewish reading Jewish. of that is a real building. The earliest church fathers believed that. Irenaeus, Lactantius, Commodianus, and others in the second century. They had the whole of that 70th week thing worked out. But the other system destroyed it by saying the Pope is the man of sin, extended over 2,000 years. Well, we may not think that the Pope so, is exactly... So did you change from a physical temple, a repealed yeah. temple, yeah. to something else coming with, with the Catholic, the early Catholic Yeah, they turned the temple of God, and Paul does use that as a metaphor of the church. But yeah, a lot of people say the temple is the church, that's right. but all yeah. of us are the And temple. it is when you say a temple. Yeah. yeah. It, grammatically, it's interesting that when Paul introduces you as the temple, he doesn't say you are the temple when he introduces you. You are a temple of God, a metaphor. And collectively, you are a temple. And individually, don't ruin your body by taking in the wrong foods and all that, because you are a temple of God. But when he says the man sin, sits in the temple of God, everything shrieks at us, really, I think, in terms of literal temple. Anyway, okay, so I used to talk about this, Paul said. I love it. Now, you know what's restraining him. Actually, we don't. Whether it's the angelic forces that God allows to watch over the politics, I, I don't know. I'll tell you what it isn't, though. It's not the Holy Spirit. The preacher of rapture people say that this <coughs> apostasy here is the departure of the church. That's a twisting of the word. Apostasia is the natural meaning of that. It's an apostasy falling away from the faith. They say, I'll go here. It means the departure. <laughs> that's, that's a twist. They would go to every length to get this wrong. That's what's so scary. 
No, apostasy is apostasy. It's correctly translated, not departure. The, the restrainer, by the way, uh, yeah. the, the yeah. early Jewish Christian yeah. tradition was of an angel, probably Michael, right. since he also restrains Absolutely. in Daniel 10. That's the best. So the best could be an art the angel. Yeah. They're controlling. Verse 7, which yes. kind of sound like yeah. who, he who now restrains. Yes, definitely a person. Right. It's definitely a person and male. Male. It's both masculine yes. and neuter. You know what neuter is restraining, and you know he who is both genders here. Right. However, you construe that. Both things. Right. The mystery now, the secret working of lawlessness in 7, <coughs> is at work. I like that at work Greek word, energite. It has energy. We're talking about energy here. Does it have energy? Yes, we're talking television. It's backed by billions of dollars for start. Huge churches. It has a huge energy. It's energite. It's at work. Energizing. Because the teachings energize people in various directions. What's that verse? That is in verse uh, 7, right? 7. Only he who hears the personal restrainer, will go on restraining until he's removed. The dam breaks, and then, watch out, that lawless one, the man of sin, abomination of desolation, saying what he ought not to, will be revealed as our third, use the word revealed, whom the Lord, Jesus, that will be, will slay with the breath of his mouth, just go, whoosh, and you're dead, and bring to an end by the outshining of his parousia, here are two words, epiphania, the out, the brilliance, you might say, of his parousia. Clearly we're talking about the one spectacular event. Okay. It's not much of a fight, is it? No. <laughs> no. Now he piles on some more here. I'm glad we're, we're able to record this, because we, we'll just stick this up at our site, and, and, and we'll get lots of interest in this subject, though, a huge amount of interest. Okay, so we've got, uh, that's to say the lawless one is going to be revealed. Now, nine. He's the one then who's coming. Oh, did you catch that? This lawless one has a bugger seal. Isn't that spectacular? He's aping the second coming. The devil will go to every length to pretend to be Jesus. You ever thought of that? Don't you believe in Jesus? It's a great counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Opposition by imitation. imitation. I like that. Opposition by, in, that's the cleverest way to go, isn't it? Satan dressed up as Jesus. In another Jesus that came as an avatar figure from the sky, entered into the womb. It's very Gnostic and very fake. Isn't it? And if you can't convince them, confuse them. Yeah, I like that. That's a good line. If you can't convince them, confuse them. You, you end so, up com convincing them by your confusion. <laughs> yes, that's right. Something like that. Anyway, not to make us feel smug in any way, but we need to be alert. That's the one then who's parousia, same word. Parousia is in accordance, and I have to pile up the words here. Paul really sat down and planned this stuff. Is in accordance with the energia, the energy of Satan, activity, of the Satan, who is not human nature, this is the external fallen angel, the Satan. The energy of the Satan with all kinds of power and signs and lying miracles. So we have to say a miracle by itself doesn't prove anything. It can be, at least to the extent that God allows it. I know that the magicians in Egypt were not able to do certain things, but they could turn rods into snakes at least, right? So you compare them with the magicians in Egypt. All sorts of miracles. I right, time to quit here. All, look at the pile-up of words, all the deception of wickedness for those who are perishing. You stop there and I used to say this in class. Okay, here's how to perish if you want to perish. You want to perish? Wait for this. You want to perish. You want to go to rack and ruin. You want to lose your salvation and die forever. Right? Here's how you do it. Give them a little pause to think about that. Because a passion for truth they would not have in order to be saved. Right? No passion for truth, no salvation. Not a lukewarm approach. Not all oh, um, so what? You know, who cares? No. Because Tina Hapi, I did this in the Greek because it impressed me so much. Tina Hapi, 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 Tina Hapi
So passion for truth is advised here, is to be recommended and commended, I think, in order to be saved. It's not just for another to be you know, a bit better than worse, no, to be saved. For this reason, if you don't take this attitude, verse 11, God will send them a deluding influence. And the little old ladies in your country will come up and go, oh, no, 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 God couldn't do that. Oh, it's true. This is a very unpopular verse. God will deliberately show you what it's like to be confused. And we've seen it now. That's very, very dangerous. If we don't have a love of truth, that's it. But then he lightens up a little bit. Well, let me do 12. In order that they all may be judged, condemned in this case, adversely judged, who did not believe the truth. It would seem very much advisable to believe the truth then, but delighted in wickedness. Isn't that an amazing contrast? You're wicked, you don't believe the truth. Got it? You're wicked, you don't believe the truth. That's what Paul does. That's the Pauline mind here. It's a sheer wickedness to say, I don't care whether the truth is the truth. What? You better care. This is the, the impulse here. Okay, then he lights up a bit, all but a bit heavy here. Pretty hard work. No, I shouldn't say that. No, I, I admire this guy. I'd like to meet him, wouldn't you? And then he says, in order that they all may be charged who didn't believe the truth, the opposite of that is to be wicked. But, now, 13, lighten up a bit. We should always give thanks to you, brethren, brothers and sisters, who, whom the Lord loves, beloved by, by Jesus the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning, for salvation, and that doesn't deny your cooperative effort with that, of course, it's not Calvinism, through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Amazing, Calvinism. So whatever's true, it's wise to believe that. Okay, so stand firm, he said, let's finish with this. Stand firm, brothers and sisters, 15. And hang on to those true biblical traditions that you were taught, whether by word or mind word of mouth, or by letter from us. Wow, Paul's quite on. Anyway, any points on that we want to raise before we close down for today? Okay, we communion. Saying, we're going to do a communion with Carlos and Mom, yes. We were saying uh, last week how much of uh, Scripture is learned by the question and answer kind of method. Who is Jesus? Who yeah. is God? What is the gospel? Yeah. Well, the whole question uh, that revolves around the rapture thing is how do we get to be with Jesus? Exactly right. And that I think is a, a kind of practical question that we can put to friends and neighbors. How, how do we get to be with Jesus? Right. And of course there is an alternate answer that's being put out there. But the yeah. <laughs> Well, even before you get to that, how do you get to the real Jesus? <laughs> how do you get to the real Jesus? Okay. He well, says, well, it will lead them. And he says, this is the way we get to be with Jesus. Yeah, right this there. is this the, way, is the means know, by this. This is the way we get to be with Jesus. Okay. That, that's very stirring, yes. actually. I mean, we're facing things that these people weren't facing. I cannot pick Jesus. That's right. Or Jesus is. Yeah. There are many Jesus. What amazed me of picking up this 25 texts for the so-called rapture and 25 texts for the so-called the real second coming, they had the gall to give the Thessalonian ones as the rapture, the preacher rapture. But one of them, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, they decided that's the real second coming. So just look at it. It's terribly the song. It's not an honest way to deal with this. Okay, very good. We're going to move to the community service now. Yep. And Carlos is going to decide for that first. No. And then we'll sing to him at the end of all that. And, uh, okay. So, so, you can pray at the end of the room? Sure. Like that. Yeah. But not the end of the You want to? Yep, your turn. Go with this. Alright, so we do this once a month. Is that it? I forget. Alright, so I'll do a scripture reading. Uh, Sarah will help me with the bread and cup. And then uh, we'll do a prayer, closing prayer, so Judy can help us with that. Yeah. Okay, so I'll read from. Uh, actually, I was reading through the week about this. Uh, what they call Eucharist, you know, it's a Catholic thing, Eucharist. Mm -hmm. But I found the word quite powerful because it, it has a, all the connotations, all the meanings regarding the gift, the, the good gift that comes from above, the passion of the Christ, yeah. and so on. And it was also uh, interesting to read uh, the early Christians, how they 
celebrated this service, which is the reason why we get together. This is why we fellowship, by the way. This is why they got together, sometimes in caves, under duress, mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. And they got together because the Lord said, I'll be right back. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's basically what Jesus said. Yeah. Paul, I, when we read Paul, it's, it's very immediate. The gospel message is very immediate. In other words, you know, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to it. Yeah. The Lord is coming. Yeah. Right? And the actual, the, the New Testament actually ends with the words Maranatha, yeah. which means come <coughs> to Jesus. So it was an, an immediate thing. And that's what drove the faith. That's what helped it to grow. I don't know if you've questioned how can a, a system of belief, how can an idea that is based on loving your enemies, not mm. picking up swords, mm. things like that, how can it grow? Yeah. Especially in, su in such barbaric, yeah. god awful times yeah. as the Greco Roman world was. Yeah. Well, how did it grow? Because, first of all, the gifts the signs and wonders that these people did, uh, ending with Paul the Apostle. So that, you know, that's pretty attractive. But also I think the message itself, obviously, the Word of God, which is the Gospel about the coming kingdom, has great power, great energy, yeah. or it should have energy. So the other thing I found was that the early Christians usually read from a passage in the book of Hebrews, so mm. I'll read that. It's a bit long, uh, bear with me. Uh, you can follow it. It's uh, Hebrews 12. And I'll start from verse 28 forward. Now, I did sort of my own paraphrase translation here from various points, trying to capture, as Anthony said, a translation tries not only to be literal, you know, faithful to the words, but also try to capture the meaning and the spirit and the nuance of, of the language. Of the English language. Okay, so I'll go Hebrews 12, 28. So since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us give thanks, and through this let us offer worship pleasing to God in reverent fear, for our God is indeed a devouring fire. That's the uh, oven verse. Mm -hmm. You should have one here, oven. Oh, okay. Okay. Continue to love each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as, you, as if you were in prison with them, and those who suffer adversity, since you too are vulnerable to diversity. Adversity, I'm sorry. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and remain faithful to one another in their respective marriage. Mm -hmm. For God will judge those who commit sexual immorality, especially those who make break marriage vows mm -hmm. through adultery. Mm -hmm. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere man do to me? <laughs> There's a mere man. Mere man, mere man Remember those who lead you in the church, who speak the word of God to you, that is, the gospel. Consider the results of their godly conduct and follow the example of their faith. Like Jesus, our Lord and Messiah, the same yesterday, today, mm. and for the ages. Mm -hmm. Do not be carried away by all sorts of diverse and strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be made strong by grace. This strength does not come from following ritualistic meals like the temple sacrifices, things that have benefited those who, that have never sorry, benefited those who practice mm. such things. Christians have an altar which those who minister in the tabernacle have no right or authority to eat from. Mm -hmm. Under the old system, that is Torah, mm -hmm. the Jewish high priest 
brought the blood of animals into the holy place in the temple as a, as a sacrifice for sin, and the animals were burned outside the, the temple or the city gates. That is why Jesus also suffered outside the city gates to make clean anyone willing by his own blood and suffering what he experienced. For in this present evil age, we have no permanent city state or country we are looking forward for the one that is coming therefore through jesus let us continue to thank god father with a sacrifice that is the fruit of our lips which should praise his name do not forget to do good and fellowship these are the sacrifices that please god continue to obey your church leaders doing what they say. Their work is to watch over you as those who must give an account. Let them do this with joy and not complaining so that to be burdensome for them, this obviously will not benefit you. Now may the, get, uh, the God of peace who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the new eternal covenant uh, give you everything you need according to his will God is working with you remember to achieve that which pleases God through his son Jesus to whom be glory to the ages of the ages everybody say amen amen, amen. so uh, Sarah will uh, share a scripture there that is very uh, she will pass the mm -hmm. right now so I'll do that while she reads mm -hmm. while they were eating Jesus took some bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body So those were the words of our Lord Jesus, which Paul echoes verbatim, by the way, which shows that he was well aware of the condition, so we'll take the bread and eat it. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sin. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, oh, Jesus. Oh, that was for him.
Ah, Judy. Oh, yeah. Dan, we'll do a closing prayer. Here is. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've provided for us. We thank you for the comfort that your words offer. We thank you for that covenant promise. We thank you that we will be gathered together with you and that we can understand and rightly divide the parousia. I thank you for the Messiah. I thank you for the sacrifice that was made for us. And I thank you, God, that we can live faithfully, that we can apply all that we know from your word, and that we can be faithful servants day in and day out so that we will participate in that kingdom. Mm -hmm. And for all of these things, we're grateful, and I especially look to you, uh, Tom, at this time, Mm -hmm. and God for watching over, keeping him comfortable, and comforting him Mm -hmm. in the name of your son, the Messiah, Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Singing? Right, if you want. Yeah. 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 The, the, the pizza guy will be here at 12.15. <laughs> <laughs> the the pizza guy. 12.15. The other the song. Are you yep. singing in front? No. Are you sure? Oh, it's under my feet. I'm good. Yep. Thank you. Just I got a... Yes, uh, yes I changed the uh, game of order. Just saying. All right. I think All right. this Best, yeah, I did. Better than singing. Mm-hmm. Singing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the song? It's called Low. He comes with clouds. Low. Low. So low. Low. He comes low. <laughs> he comes. He's going to come low. He's coming with clouds, but I think he's going to be bringing the saints. <laughs> Will they find it under that word, or is it, it's a different, the tune of oh, the right. tune is Angels from the Realms of Glory, which yeah. is kind of yeah. so We have words that are probably not online. Right? Uh, yeah, this is good. Um, there are words that are online that say something like, Come the Everlasting God, or something like that. So we have Messiah, we, we have Jesus and Messiah, and stuff like that. But I, the other words that are in, in the book that I have are, have God coming back and yeah. Okay. In ancient typo sense.